Um, if you're like me and you've lost your father, then it's a, certainly a day of introspection uh, and a day to sort of consider things. Uh, I do wish that I had considered my father a little bit more. Um, uh, maybe worked a little bit harder to overlook some of his deficiencies as well as appreciate uh, the things that, that he contributed to me. Because now looking back on my father, all I think about is his horrible sense of humor, his love of antique automobiles, and the positive memories that we have. Many of the other things just sort of fall by the wayside, don't they? And so I encourage you to do that um, while you have the opportunity. With that in mind, let's turn to the book of Proverbs today. Um, as we do that, let me talk a little bit about this background. I, I, I go to various sources to get my backgrounds, and then I edit them as I have need. Uh, um, this background began like this. Okay? I, I purchased it like this. I want you to notice something here. Um, as a father, I sort of find myself taking offense to, to things like this. Okay, look, look how it's depicted. You've got the mother in a nice, calm, open, uh, you know, with her body language, with her hand calmly on the knee of her daughter. Her daughter's smiling. She's smiling. They're having a wonderful conversation. The dad, on the other hand, well, he's got his finger pointing at him, wagging his finger at him. His eyebrows indicate that he's angry. His mouth is open in what seems to be strong language. And what's the son doing? <laughs> Blocking his ears to the instruction of his father. Now, I don't know how accurate this is for many of us, but it, it seems to, to tip the scales on the side of the mother, maybe, and uh, so if you notice, I did some subtle changes. Here is the father. I wanted to just move the kid's arms around, which I can do and I have done in the past, but I didn't do that. But I did give the father the benefit of the doubt. And I changed his, uh, his, his attitude a little bit. He's no longer wagging his finger at his son. And uh, he's concerned now more so than overtly angry. Um, so I'm trying, I tried to benefit the fathers here in just the prep work for the background. And uh, so that was subtle, but I wanted to point that out. Now, I say all of this to say, you know, the, the role of a father really is under attack in many respects. I don't believe so necessarily here. Among our families, maybe even within our general communities, but at large. The role of a father is, is under question now more than it ever has been. How valuable, how necessary is a father? There are some uh, celebrity women who have overtly said fathers are of absolutely no necessity. In fact, they've gone and, and, and uh, you know, taken advantage of technological means to become impregnated and have said outright, men are not necessary. I don't buy it. Uh, we recognize that God created roles for, for the man and the woman, for the husband and the wife, for the mother and for the father. Now, I, I readily understand that sometimes circumstances affect the ability or the presence of fathers and or mothers. But the father is valuable within a home. Uh, a preacher friend of mine and I, and I'll tell you, Brian Reed preaches at Ivy Bluff. He and I were in contact uh, sharing uh, ideas about Father's Day sermons. And so together we came up with this. Now, he did it a completely different way than I did. If you want to study in how different preachers approach the same topic, listen to Brian Reed's sermon today, which has the same title and is taken from the same general text. We'll have the same points but will likely be a drastically different sermon, not quite as good as the one that I'm going to deliver for you this morning. I say that because he and I are good friends. Um, but anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of Proverbs today, and we're going to try to draw for ourselves a picture of a virtuous father. Proverbs 31 presents to us the virtuous woman, and I've preached that from the perspective of a virtuous mother. But Proverbs has much to say about the role of a father. In fact, Proverbs is occasioned 
by the advice that a father wants to give his son. Hence frequently this, my son, listen to the instructions of your father. That's repeated as a theme throughout the book of Proverbs. It might very well be that Solomon wanted to give inspired advice to his son Rehoboam. But regardless, there is much to say about the role of fathers and a virtuous father can be seen in really two ways. Number one, what he is. And number two, what he does. What he is and what he does. And we'll have several points. The first two will contribute to that thought, what he is. We can open up this morning in Proverbs chapter 19, and you can look at verse 14, which says, House and wealth are inherited from fathers. And the ESV says, but. The King James says, and. But the ESV says, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. I want you to notice the contrast that's set up by Solomon in Proverbs 19 and verse 14. When we say, what is the role of a father, it might very well be that a good many of us will start with provider. And certainly a father classically has been provider. And in many respects, that's the, the, a role for which God designed us. But I want you to notice the contrast set up. He says, yes, inheritance, that is in the financial realm of a family, the father is going to play a healthy role, maybe the primary role relative to that, but what is even more important than that? But his connection to his family, right? He says, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. What he's saying is that family connection is even more valuable than the inheritance you could get from your father. In a time when fathers were solely responsible for the financial uh, direction of the household. He says even far more valuable is that father's connection to the family. Let's start there this morning. Fathers are important. You as a father are far more important to your family than merely in your help your family's paying bills. It goes so much deeper than that. The most important role that you have is as father and husband in your household. So many times fathers believe that their only or their greatest contribution is their breadwinning. And they begin to wrap their whole identity up in how they provide, in the work that they do, in the way that they advance in their jobs, in the way that they're seen in the workplace. And that becomes the primary focus of that husband, of that father, of that man. But God tells us through the inspired Solomon that it's far more important what their connection is to their family. Their role as husband and their role as father. And we see then that contrast between paternity, that is their role of father, and prosperity, their role as provider. I want you to understand when it comes to what you are. Fathers, you are important to your family, regardless of whatever else might happen outside of that home. Number two, a virtuous father is invested. A virtuous father is invested. As we continue to look at uh, some of the passages seen throughout the book of Proverbs, we take a look at Proverbs chapter 23. Look at verse 24. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. If we couple that with many of the passages that talk about the shame that fathers and mothers feel when their children leave the faith, when they are unwise, when they engage in foolish behavior, we combine that with this statement that fathers and mothers rejoice with the righteousness of their children. What we see is that a virtuous father should be, must be, invested in the spiritual well-being of their children. Fathers, what would make you the happiest in regards to your children? 
I've shared with you the dreams I had of my children becoming professional athletes. And oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? There's not, I don't know that there are many fathers who, when they first learn they're going to be dads, they don't say, oh, you know, wouldn't it be great if little Johnny played professional basketball? Or, man, imagine him suiting up for the Braves and hitting a home run. You know, wouldn't that be amazing? I'm a Tennessee fan, and I watched Tennessee walk off a win in the first game of the College World Series. Dylan Dryling hit that game-winning hit, and they interviewed his parents, and he said, being a father and watching your son do that, isn't that a dream? Oh, absolutely. But what are you most invested in your children to do? Well, what would mean the most to you relative to your children? We've studied 2 John, and, and John would write, I have no greater joy in 3 John than to hear my children walk in truth. No greater joy. What brings us the greatest joy? For what are we the most invested in our children? Shouldn't it be their spiritual well-being? I hope that my kids can, can run fast and jump high. I hope that my kids can make good grades and get good jobs. I hope that my kids can be happy, healthy, and well-adjusted in life. But more than anything else, shouldn't we wish? Shouldn't we hope? Shouldn't we work for? Shouldn't we be invested so that our kids can get to heaven? Shouldn't that be the primary goal? A virtuous father, number one, is important. A virtuous father, number two, is and must be invested. Gone should be the days. We should never entertain the idea that the father can be the disinterested party sitting in the recliner, unaware and unconcerned about what his children are doing. That shouldn't be a virtuous father. A father should be plugged in and invested in primarily the spiritual well-being of their children. Fathers, it says in Proverbs 23, of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. So what is a virtuous father? Number one, he is important. Number two, he is invested. But what does that look like? What does a virtuous father do. What does he do? Well, as we look at the book of Proverbs, we turn now to Proverbs chapter 4. And when I read verse 3, I was, I was immediately struck by this first phrase, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Young man, have, have, has anybody ever said that? Man, you are your father's son. Have you ever said that? What does that mean? Well, it means you're just like your dad, doesn't it? It means you're like your father. And so what Solomon is saying here is there was a time when my being was wrapped up in trying to be like my father. Uh, there's, to me, no more entertaining group of commercials than those, are you becoming like your parents? I don't know what insurance company it is. They all kind of blend together. But, you know, becoming like your parents, you know. And, it, and it, it, it talks about all of the little ways in which we become our parents. Inevitably, all many of the things that we say, oh, when I become a parent, I will never be. Or when I grow up, I'll never. We end up looking like, acting like, even saying verbatim some of the things that our parents have said. I've even witnessed my children, as young as they are, telling their siblings things that we told them, sounding like parents themselves to their siblings and to younger children around them. I was my father's son. What does a, a virtuous father do? Number one, he influences. Before a single word comes out of your father's mouth, he's influencing you. Before you as a father... Say one single thing. Instruct in one single way. You are teaching your child by who you are. By the influence that you project. We all influence. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. We all have influence. And as fathers, we begin to influence our children from the, the youngest of ages. You know, studies in language have found that children in the womb are 
are better able to understand multiple languages if their parents speak multiple languages. That they come out of the womb better prepared to understand multiple languages. You know what that tells me? We can impact our children even before they're born. That that environmental influence begins even before those children are outside of the womb. Fathers, the influence that you can have on your children is so vital and is so important. What are the patterns that you're presenting for your child? Understand, fathers, that everything you do is setting a pattern for who your children will become. Positively and negatively. What is your influence? So, what does he do? Number one, a virtuous father influences. But number two, a virtuous father instructs. I grew up like many of you on some of the classic sitcoms, you know, Family Matters and, and or, or whatever, you know, various family ties, I don't know what, I'm, the, I can't even think of them now, uh, Full House and other uh, sitcoms and many of them ended with the dad sitting on the edge of the bed doing what? Giving the lesson for the, the, for the episode, right? You know, talking to little Johnny or little Jane about the lessons that were learned, instructing them directly. And I always thought, man, I can't wait till I'm a dad and I can do that. But it doesn't look like often it does in the TV shows and the movies, does it? But fathers are supposed to instruct. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of your father. Forsake not the law of your mother. And that is sprinkled throughout the, the text of Proverbs as a thread, as the backbone of the text. In verse 1 of chapter 13, a wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scorner hears not rebuke. In chapter 15 and verse 5, a fool despises his father's instruction, but he that re, uh, regardeth reproof is prudent. Instruction. Fathers, you are to instruct. Maybe that's why this picture looks the way that it does. Is it the case often that the mom becomes the comforter and the dad becomes the guide, the corrector? So often it seems like that is how that becomes and, and maybe that's the way that God designed us. It seems that that is in fact the case. Which means we as fathers need to be ready and willing to tow that line to lay down the law, to give those commands, to provide that instruction, and to do so in a way that teaches our children that truth cannot be compromised. And we'll talk about this in another point in just a moment. But fathers are often the first line of defense for our children to understand that certain things just have to be done. That instructions need to be followed unless it's hanging a ceiling fan or putting together a table. Then you don't have to follow instructions. You just do it and hope for the best. But we need to follow instructions. And as fathers, we need to be individuals who demonstrate that and demand that precepts of God be followed. That's the key word there. Commands, precepts, instructions. Fathers need to make clear that there are certain rules, there are certain, there are certain instruction that needs to be listened to, rules that need to be followed, laws that need to be obeyed. And fathers often are the first line of defense. Patterns, influence. Precepts, instruction. Number three, you go to Proverbs chapter 22. And I want you to look at verse 28 and I want you to notice what Solomon has to say here. Again, talking to, to maybe his son, but, but to all sons and daughters and to the, the, the world at large, he says, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Now, it's, it's to me very interesting to consider that in the context of the nation of Israel. God gave them physical land promises, which means there were literal landmarks that each tribe received literally a certain portion of land. And so those landmarks began 
quite literally. Have you ever had a dispute over landlines? Where this marker should be? Where your property ended and another person's property began? There are situations where that has caused great trouble. Where it has caused maybe generations of disagreements and disputes over where a marker should be placed. Before you buy property, almost inevitably, what do you have to do? You have to get a survey done, right? You've got to see where this marker should be placed and where that marker should be placed. And so from a very physical standpoint, you see that Solomon says, don't remove the ancient landmarks, those physical markers of land, and who put them there? Well, your fathers did. Your father and your father's father and your father's father, 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 all of those guys, they put those landmarks there. And they shouldn't be moved. But then let's move into the figurative realm. Because I believe that's really what Solomon is saying, don't you? There are principles, there are guidelines, there are laws and there are rules that God has set in place. And we fathers can be the first line of defense to ensure that those spiritual landmarks aren't moved. Dear friends, we live in a world that has attempted to move literally every landmark that has been placed into existence. Is there anything in our culture that isn't challenged today? Any moral standard, any ethical standard, any spiritual guideline that has not been challenged and that people haven't attempted to move? Fathers, it's up to you and me and mothers, aunts and uncles, Everyone, it's up to us to ensure that those landmarks are not moved. Don't remove the ancient landmarks. Maintain that sense of this is right and this is wrong. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. We've got to maintain that landmark. God is the Father and ruler of all. Jesus Christ, His Son, died for our sins. He purchased the church through which we all can be saved. Colossians 3 and verse 17, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. We must maintain the ancient landmarks, the authority of God, the authority of His Word. It's up to you and me to maintain that. Patterns, influence. Precepts, instruction. Protection of those ancient landmarks. Insulating our children from the changes and the movement that goes on in the outside world. Fathers and mothers, do everything you can to build a wall around your children relative to those ancient landmarks. That those things that are the foundational points in their lives are not moved. What did Paul say concerning Timothy? From a child, what happened? He had known the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make him wise unto salvation. His mother and his grandmother, in that instance, did not remove the ancient landmarks. They underscored that foundation, and you and I need to do the same. Patterns, precepts, protection, influences, instruction, insulation. Now, a virtuous father integrates. I I found this passage, many of these things that we've talked about so far you're probably familiar with. You've probably seen and read in the book of Proverbs. But what about this one? If you go to Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 10, it says, Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not find that interesting. It goes on to say, Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. I wonder what is Solomon getting at when he says, Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. A virtuous father integrates. What do I mean by that? A virtuous father works diligently to create a network of faithful people around that child. That's what I believe Proverbs 27 and verse 10 is getting at. Your friends and your father's friends don't forsake. It's as if that father has devoted his life to making connections to people that his children can depend on. 
that His children can follow, that His children can, can look to as influences and guides in their lives so that when those children grow up, they can lean on the same individuals that the Father leaned on. So what we need to do as fathers and mothers, as those who are rearing godly children, is we need to work on establishing and developing that godly network in our children, for our children. Because there is no single greater indicator of our children's future faithfulness than who they are around on a regular basis. Those of you who teach, you've seen it, haven't you? A child from a good home and a good family, a godly situation, falls in with what? The wrong crowd. And it's not long until that child ends up behaving in ways that they never would have behaved before. Now there are some situations in which we, we don't have as much control as we would like over the network of our, of our children. But it falls squarely at the feet of us fathers and mothers to do everything we can to provide that godly network for our children. Uh, let me plug Bible camps. Let me plug vacation Bible schools. And by the way, I was so concerned with my wife and son going to the ER that I forgot to commend all of those who had a hand in the, the meal yesterday and the, the decorations and getting ready for vacation Bible school. And let me not be negligent to say this too. We're, we're building on the shoulders of those who have done this for years. There's some new faces involved this year, but thank you so much for everybody who's always done this and continues to be a part of what we do here. I hope and I know that this will be a great success. But think about all of those things that are offered that can help our children make godly connections. In my estimation, when I send my kid to a Bible camp, when we have them be involved in things related to the church, that's one more opportunity for them to make a godly connection. When we go over to other Christian families' homes, when we interact with people outside of this building who share our, our values and our devotion to God, that's one more opportunity for our children to create a network of godly people who can help them get to heaven. Because when I'm not around, you know whose voice they will hear? The people they're connected to. The friends, the co-workers, the classmates, you name it. Those people have a voice in the lives of our children. And so Solomon says, hey, your friend and your father's friend, don't forsake them. Well, what that tells me is as a father, I need to work hard to make those friends the kind of people they can count on. That can lead them in the direction that they need to go even when I'm not around. And so what does that tell me? Well, I integrate my child into that faithful network. I provide them that faithful network. What he is and what he does. As we think about all that we've talked about relative to the virtuous father, what have we seen? Well, we've seen that a virtuous father is important. There may not be anything more important than the Christian life of parents as they lead and guide their children. But not only is a virtuous father important, a virtuous father needs to be invested. He needs to be focused on the spiritual well-being of his child. But what does he do? What does he do? He influences, he instructs, he insulates, and ultimately he integrates that child into the godly network that he's created. Dear friends, God bless faithful fathers, virtuous fathers, fathers who seek to please God in their own lives and to set the stage for their children to do the same. This morning, as we broaden the scope not only to fathers, but to mothers, to husbands, to wives, to sons and daughters, to aunts and uncles, to grandfathers and grandmothers. Let me ask the question, what kind of father, mother, sister, brother, aunt, uncle are you? Are you virtuous? 
Are you striving to meet these qualities that we've outlined this morning? And so let me ask number one, dear father, mother, sister, brother, husband, wife, whatever the case might be, are you number one setting the example, providing the influence that those around you can follow? You know, here's one very interesting point. I told you that I've lost my physical father, and yet I can list for you five or six spiritual fathers that I love and adore in my life, some of whom I've also lost, but many of whom I could still count on to this very day to do all of the things that we've outlined this morning. What if you are that to somebody and you don't even realize it? Or what if you could have been that, but you've neglected your own spiritual life? This morning, are you virtuous? Are you righteous before God? What is your influence right now? If you're not faithful to God, if if you're a Christian but there is sin that has come between you and your Father in heaven, I want you to understand that there are other people besides you it might impact. There are eyes looking at you. There are legs wanting to follow you. There are hands wanting to do what you may very well be doing right now. If you're not faithful to God, I invite you to make it right, not only for yourself, but for those who might follow you down the path of destruction. What do you need to do? If you're a Christian and there's sin in your life, repent. We spoke last Sunday morning about what John said to all of those who came to him. Do do works meet worthy of repentance. You've got to change your mind. You've got to change your life. If you're sinning, stop it. Repent as publicly as that's known. And begin once again to set the right influence for your family and for those who might look to you. But then this morning, if you're not a Christian, you can't be the most virtuous father, mother, sister, brother, whatever the case might be. Set the example of obedience in your life. If you're not a Christian this morning and you've reached the age of accountability, you understand what sin does in separating us from God, turning His ear from us that He will not hear, and you recognize this morning that you need sin wiped from your account through obedience, then today, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 3, 16, repent of your sins. We've mentioned what John said in in Matthew 3, in Mark chapter 1, throughout the pages of the New Testament. Repent and bring forth works worthy of repentance. This morning, are you willing to confess the name of Jesus before witnesses? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Are you willing this morning to be buried with Him in baptism for the remission of your sins, to contact His blood at His death, Romans 6, 3, and 4? This morning, do you need to become a virtuous mother, father, sister, brother, man, woman? Do it today. Obey the gospel and be restored as together we stand and sing.